Hello friends. It's so wonderful to have you with me today. This video we are going to be taking a look at the history and life of Queen Matilda or Matilda of Flanders. Now you'll remember me talking about this particular Matilda because there was a lot of Matildas back in this century. But this Matilda in particular was the wife of William I or William the Conqueror, which we spoke about in our Kings and Queens series. And if you've missed that video, I'll make sure to have it pop up here, and I'll also include it in the description. Now, more often than not, the queens of England are very often overlooked. A lot of emphasis is on the king, and there weren't a lot of female rulers during this century, but the queens of England, the spouses of the king, were, again, more often than not, very important part to ruling the kingdom and keeping peace. They participated frequently in politics, made decisions, and even, in Matilda's case, completely was in charge of a country whilst her husband was busy. So I want to explore the Queens of England because they are always left out and their history is sometimes as fascinating as their male counterparts. So. Matilda of Flanders. And again, I've put together this little information PDF with uh, all different facts that are very easy to digest. There's nothing too complicated to understand in this. And I will make this available to download for your own personal use. Or if you're a teacher or, you know, an educational person that would like to show this to a, a student body or, I don't know, something like that, then I'll make it available so you can do that. Alright, so, what do we know about Matilda? So she was born as Matilda of Flanders. Now, we don't really know when she was born, but historians think that it's around 1031. An exact date isn't really known. I suppose back in those days, um, birth deaths weren't as commonly registered um, as uh, meticulously as what they are now. As Especially um, if you were a female being born into royalty, your brothers were more important than you. So you were just, just born and then that was it. Your birth date wasn't very significant or worth writing down. She died in November, the 2nd of November, 1083. Her official title was the Queen of England and Duchess of Normandy. She was regent of Normandy during William's absences from the duchy when he was uh, conquering England. Now, just to reiterate, a duchy is the territory of a duke or duchess, basically a 
dukedom. So that's not a kingdom because it's ruled by a duke, so therefore a dukedom. And her spouse, of course, was William the Conqueror. Now she had uh, a lot of children with William. So history tells us she had ten children. Can you imagine ten children? She had four sons and at least five daughters. Again, like I said, where the inaccuracies come from with the daughter part is that nobody cared about the daughters. All they cared about was the sons to continue on the lineage of the family name and to keep the throne in the family. And this is what happened. Two of her sons, William the Second and Henry the First, went on to become kings. And we will be looking at those two in more detail as well. Alright, so who was Matilda? So like we said, she was born in 1031 and she was born into the House of Flanders. And this is the House of Flanders uh, sigil the black lion there. So the House of Flanders was also called the Baldwins because it was founded by Baldwin I, also known as Iron Arm, and it was a medieval ruling family. So I guess um, in comparison, if you've watched Game of Thrones, you can say that these houses was uh, was like like the Lannisters or the Tyrells there was lots of different royal families so Matilda was the second daughter of Count Baldwin V of Flanders now Flanders was actually quite a strategic uh, place in Europe so, this was a very important family. We can see here in this little um, uh, timeline family tree, we have Robert Baldwin V of Lille. Then his children here, which you have Robert the I, Baldwin the VI, Matilda here and her sister Judith. So they were quite an important family. So no actual image of Matilda has actually survived from this uh, period in time when she lived. All these pictures were done a um, long, long, long time after um, she was alive and statues and so on. But there have been many, many testimonies from uh, respectable people during that time. And some of these uh, basically say how wonderful she was and how graceful and uh, intellectual and uh, just amazing <laughs> she was. For instance, she was an individual who possessed beauty of person, high birth, a cultivated mind, and exalted virtue. She was even more distinguished for the purity of her mind and manners than for her illustrious lineage. She united beauty with gentle breeding and all the graces of Christian holiness. So remember, Back in this time, women were, I guess for want of a better word, just there to produce heirs. It didn't really matter if you were very beautiful or very smart. As long as you produced 
heirs to the throne, male heirs, then you are okay. But when someone like Matilda, who was both beautiful and smart, this obviously made a very big impression on people. So, what can we learn about Matilda's upbringing, her years growing up? So, you know that Matilda eventually married William I, but she didn't marry him right away, as she had her eye set on somebody else, but it didn't go to plan. So when she was between 15 and 18, remember back in those times, you were courted very, very young and married very, very young, so this isn't uh, out of the ordinary for this time. King Edward, the confessor of England, sent an ambassador to Flanders, and he was a man named uh, Brithic, I think that's how you say it, B-R-I-H-T-R-I-C, Brithic Mao, M-A-U, who was a rich Anglo-Saxon landowner. Now apparently, Matilda fell so hopelessly in love with him, and she sent a letter to him asking him to marry her without her parents' permission. But he actually rejected her proposal. And of course, Matilda was furious, absolutely furious. Because not only had she been turned down, she had actually risked her reputation and lost. So if anybody found out about it, she would have been made a laughing stock. And of course this would have had a detrimental effect on her future because if any uh, potential suitors found out that she had been rejected, then they would have thought, hmm, I wonder what's wrong with her. And plus, it was really not common for women to ask men to marry them. That's very no-no. So anyway, apparently, years later, when she did eventually marry William I, or William the Conqueror, she used her authority to confiscate Brithick's lands and throw him into prison, where he actually died. So, of course, you know, never scorn a woman, especially a, a young woman in love, right? She'll hold on to that forever. So you can see that Matilda was very headstrong. She knew what she wanted, and if she didn't, she was likely to hold a grudge. <laughs> so don't mess with her, right? All right. So how did she meet William the Conqueror? So, as we found out before, William was the only son of Robert I, who was Duke of Normandy. Again, a very, very important place in the world at that time. But William's mother, Hervella, was actually a common woman and did not marry Robert I. So when she had William, he was considered an illegitimate child, and history even gave him the nickname William the Bastard. So he's got three different names, William the Bastard, William the Conqueror, and then William the First. So um, it's said that William's mother, Hervella, was actually... Um, Robert the First's concubine, so like mistress or, you know, bit on the side. Um, and Robert the First's uh, wife didn't actually have any uh, offspring um, of her own, so William was literally the only child left. So Robert said that William was his heir, and therefore William became uh, official like royalty. However, Matilda 
was so much more of a higher birth than William because of this and hierarchy, hierarchically, <laughs> um, in hierarchy, it made them not a good match. Um, so he was, uh, <laughs> it was uh, almost impossible to uh, try and uh, woo her necessarily because, you know, there was no chance for him. didn't stop William. He was equally as headstrong as Matilda and knew what he wanted. And there's lots and lots of legend according to how William wooed Matilda. And we spoke about that a little bit in the previous video, but there are a couple of different accounts of this rough wooing. <laughs> so according to legend, William actually sent his representative to ask for Matilda's hand in marriage. But Matilda said that she was far too highborn to consider marrying a bastard. <laughs> so, once this message got back to William, he rode from Normandy all the way to Bruges, found Matilda on her way to church, dragged her off her horse by her long braids, threw her down in the street in front of her flabbergasted attendants and rode off. <laughs> Crazy, right? However, another version of this story, which is similar, there's lots of braid snatching in this tale, was that William actually went to Matilda's father's house in Lille and again dragged her by her braids out of her room um, and violently battered her apparently. Um, and before Matilda's father could basically kill William for his manhandling of his daughter, Matilda got up and she basically said, I won't marry anyone else but William. So uh, it must have done it for her. <laughs> so William and Matilda didn't actually marry right away because they were related. <laughs> as many people were back in this day. Um, so, royal marriages had to abide by the laws of consanguinity, consanguinity, so, i.e. the fact that you're basically related or descended from the same ancestor. And during this time, the laws were incredibly strict restrictive and held um, held up like really really uh, strictly so they were actually third cousins once removed and there was actually a papal ban um, for their marriage by Pope Leo the ninth at the Council of Reims but being uh, Matilda and William who were very headstrong people, like we've come to find out, that didn't stop them. They eventually married in 1051 or 1052, depending on your sources, when Matilda was 20 and William was about 24. So they didn't care that the Pope said no, they just married anyway. So after many, many long years, because the marriage was considered not legal in the eyes of God and the law, they were eventually awarded a papal dispensation in 1059 by Pope Nicholas II, so their marriage would be officially legal in the eyes of the law and in the eyes of God. But they had to found two churches as penance, which I suppose in the grand scheme of things wasn't so bad. And I believe those churches um, are actually standing today. I should have fact-checked that. <laughs> I should have um, got the names for you. But anyway, they had to uh, do penance and build two churches. Okay, so that's the brief background of uh, Matilda, how, they, how she met William. But really what we want to know is... What influence did she have um, over 
politics over her king? Did she do anything um, that was, you know, important or of note? And yes, she was very, very important and had a lot of political influence. So you'll be pleased to know that unlike most royal couples in all of history, William and Matilda were very, very loyal to each other and they trusted each other implicitly and they supported each other's causes. So for example, as early as 1053, Matilda would often preside with William over his live courts and witness his charters. So that was really important. Basically, she was a fly on the wall. But the fact that she was even allowed to be present at such important political events gave her the knowledge that she needed um, in the future, which we'll come on to a little bit later. And because she was so intelligent, she would absorb this information and basically not use it to her, her advantage, but to the overall advantage of the kingdom and um, Normandy where she ruled, her and her husband ruled. So again, this comes into handy when William was often away on campaigns and he needed somebody who he could trust 100% to maintain control and carry out daily governing of Normandy where he was ruler. And of course, this was left to Matilda because he was the, she was the only one that he trusted. So another example is when William was preparing to invade England in 1066, the Battle of Hastings. Matilda actually built him a ship, like the number one ship that headed up the whole fleet. And that ship was called the Mora, as seen in the Bayeux Tapestry here. She built it completely out of his, out of her own funds and gave it to him as a sort of a good luck sort of charm. So that was really, really um, important to solidify Matilda's power, her influence, her family lineage. It was a pretty big flex for her to, uh, you know, build a ship just for the purposes of invasion. So whilst William was conquering uh, England, who was left to run Normandy because obviously he couldn't do both things at once. So he actually left the running and, you know, everything in charge to Matilda. And during this whole time, Matilda successfully guided Normandy through this whole period uh, in the name of her 14-year-old son, because obviously she couldn't uh, be the ruler on paper. Uh, she ruled in uh, instead of her uh, son, so her son was technically like the Duke of Normandy or whatever it was, but she pulled the strings, so to say. Um, and during that time, there were no major uprisings, and it was a peaceful time for Normandy, so she clearly was doing something right, and clearly she had very good favour with the people. The people liked her, because if, <laughs> if you don't like your king or your ruler, then the people would revolt, right? So anyway, of course, very, very few women had a role in politics, which is obviously testament to her abilities, because she wielded such a huge amount of power whilst William was in England conquering it, because she was able to make laws, she was able to levy taxes, and also to dispense justice. And again, um, this clearly, she was clearly doing something right because there was no um, uprights, uprights, <laughs> riots or revolts. 
and each time that William returned to England, again, she was left in charge of Normandy, and again, her political power grew, and obviously, William's trust in her. So she was very, very important and good at what she did. So, you'll be surprised to know that Matilda, even though she was a crowned king of Eng queen of England, she pretty much never visited it. <laughs> so, William was crowned king of England on Christmas Day in 1066, but... Matilda couldn't be crowned with her husband at the same time because she was heavily pregnant with her youngest daughter, Adela, who was born in January 1067. But eventually she was crowned queen on the 11th of May 1068 in Westminster during the Feast of Pentecost and this ceremony was presided over by the Archbishop of York. Now, this is a really, really important uh, thing that happened during this time. So, during her coronation, three new phrases were incorporated to cement the importance of queens. So, number one stated that they were divinely placed by God. Number two, shared in royal power. And number three, blessed by her people, by her power and virtue. So this was massively important for females um, in power, queens, because basically up until this point, they had just been um, receptacles for heirs. <laughs> but now they were given much more power, uh, much more political standing in the in the eyes of the law and of God, because obviously all of these ceremonies um, had a very religious um, uh, background to them, a uh, uh, religious standing. So, even though she was crowned queen, Matilda spent most of her time in Normandy, naturally, because her husband was so busy making changes to England, and, you know, he was too busy to rule Normandy. And she was very, very focused in keeping the established peace in Normandy, whilst William was, his attention was elsewhere. And actually, only one of her children were born in England. Henry was born in Yorkshire when Matilda accompanied her husband in the harrying of the North, which was uh, basically a number of campaigns which William waged in England in the winter of 1069 to 1070 to subjugate the northern uh, part of England. So the North has always been very, um, I wouldn't say hostile, but, you know, there's a lot of... Uh, historical fact of Game of Thrones, <laughs> they're always trying to corral the North or bring the North under the South's rule, and this was very true back in these, these times. All right. So, even though Matilda was very, um, I guess, peaceful, she did make a little bit of a mistake here. So, the little bit of history with this family feud, which I think Matilda made worse, but then rectified it later on. So, you remember me saying that Matilda and William had a son called Robert? So, in 1077, Robert instigated his first insurrection against his father, basically a rebellion, and it was because <laughs> of a prank which was played on him by his younger brothers William Rufus and Henry and they basically just dumped a full chamber pot, basically a toilet, over his head. Now, Robert, obviously being completely annoyed at this, was even further infuriated when his uh, dad, obviously King William, 
refused to punish his brothers. <laughs> so what does Robert do? He has a big strop, and the next day, him and his followers attempts, uh, attempts to seize the castle of Ruin. Now, this wasn't just a little, uh, I guess, like, battle. It was a, f it was a fully-fledged siege, but it failed. And King William ordered Robert and his followers arrest, but Robert was a coward and he fled to Flanders and cried and went to his uncle, who was Matilda's brother, Robert I, Count of Flanders, if you remember on that timeline that you saw. So basically, Robert cried and went to his uncle and hid. And this caused so much mayhem that William had to call on the help of King Philip I of France to help stop his rebellious son. So what turned from a prank into a fully-fledged rebellion, it just, it just all got out of hand. But... Matilda being the uh, good mum that she was, she obviously loved her son, she loved her king and husband, but she was sending her son money to help him get by, <laughs> because obviously he was cut off from the family for being, uh, you know, for staging an insurrection, and William was furious at his wife for this, and this did not make matters any better. So a big battle happened in 1079, where Robert and William pretty much went to war against each other, and Robert actually unhorsed um, William in combat, and actually succeeded in wounding him. But he only managed to stop killing his father when he recognised his voice. Otherwise, he would have just gone ahead and killed him, and it would be... Oh, that would have been awful for many, many reasons. So, in the Easter of 1080, a little while later, um, Queen Matilda actually managed to reunite them and pretty much bash their heads together and say, Stop! fighting you two, like, this is not helpful, it's not, um, productive, you need to just chill out. And they actually made peace because of Matilda. And she actually helped to get both sides to agree to a truce, which actually lasted until she died in 1083. So even though she made it worse in the middle of this, she actually helped to finalize it and agree, uh, help the two sides to agree, which showed how much of a diplomat she was, how much of a peacekeeper she was, and um, basically it was because of her that this family feud stopped. So, let's look at their children because they have some significance later on in the Kings and Queens series. So like we said, Matilda and William had four sons and at least five daughters. Now, this is really interesting. William was believed to have been faithful to Matilda for the entire marriage, and he never produced a child outside of their marriage. Now, that is absolutely unheard of in any royal marriage. Um... And I think it's just amazing to hear that uh, he was uh, he's so faithful and so loyal to Matilda. And I actually researched um, a little gossip story, which I didn't include in here, but I'll tell you it now. Apparently, William had the chance to be unfaithful to his wife with two, uh, like, I think they were prostitutes or something along those lines. But he got cold feet and he called the whole thing off. And he hoped that nobody would find out. But Matilda did. And you know how fierce she was when um, she was made to look a fool. So apparently both of these women died.
died in unusual circumstances <laughs> and William was pretty much sure that it was because of Matilda that these women met their grisly end, even though nothing happened. So William apparently, because he was furious at Matilda for uh, doing such a thing, apparently he had her uh, dragged naked through the streets for um, her act, but who knows if that's true or not. But I believe he was very faithful to Matilda. I think they were very similar in, in many ways, and I think they were very loyal to each other, which I think is really nice. Anyway, so he had no illegitimate children, which is good. The um, birth order of the boys is clear, obviously, because the boys are more important. But no source gives the relative order of the birth of the daughters. So um, Matilda was very, very loyal to her children, like we saw with Robert's, um, her supporting Robert through the... Uh, up, up prize, and she wanted the best for them, so she took a very, very close interest in their education, in their um, experiences in life, and actually all of her children were very, very well educated um, in comparison to other royalty during that time. Um, you know, they, obviously, religion was quite a uh, important part of their education, so, and also languages, and lots of other different things. So let's look quickly at the children here. So here is William, and here is Matilda, and this line here indicates their children. So we have Richard, Duke of Bernay, born in 1055, to 1081, Robert II, Duke of Normandy, 1054 to 1134, Henry I, 1068 to 1135, we have Agatha, 1064 to 1079, Adeliza, Adeliza, who actually became a nun, her birth date we don't know, but she died in 1056. William II, Rufus, 1057 to 1100. There's three dates here, I'm not sure what this middle one is. We have Cecilia, Apsis of Cain, 1056 to 1123. We have Adela, or Adela 1067 to 1137. And we have Constance, 1066 to 1090. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So there's a missing either, well, there's a missing daughter here somewhere if there was ten. But Matilda might have lost the child and it was never documented. We just don't know. But you can see here, this Agatha died very young. And these two daughters were given up to the service of God. One was a nun, and another was an abbess. Abbess, abbess, sorry. All right, so they are the children. So, what can we know, or what can we learn about Matilda's death? So, in the summer of 1083, Matilda fell ill, and she actually died in November in 1083 in Normandy, where she had spent most of her life. Her husband was present for her final confession, and at this time William swore to give up hunting, his favourite sport, um, to like express his grief for her death and actually he died um, only about four years later in 1087. So contrary to the common belief that she was buried at St Stephen's 
which is also called Labe or Hong. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong, in Cain. Normandy, where William was eventually buried, she's actually entombed at Cain at Labe or Dames, Dames, which is the community of Saint Trinité. And of particular interest is this 11th century slab, which is a sleek black ledger stone decorated with her epitaph, which marks her grave at the rear of the at the church. So in contrast, the grave marker for William's tomb was replaced as recently as the beginning of the 19th century. And unfortunately... Uh, over time, as many of these things happen, Matilda's tomb was desecrated and, you know, people just are so disrespectful to these things. But um, it was, uh, her original coffin was actually destroyed. But um, some <laughs> well-thinking people um, placed her remains back into like a sealed box and reburied her under this black slab. I wonder why people do that. I, I don't understand why people desecrate people's finding final resting places. So disrespectful. <laughs> All right, so that is the end. That is the life of Queen Matilda of Flanders. And I hope you'll agree with me that she was a very interesting character and it's such a shame that um, there wasn't any more information on her like you know specific things that she did for Normandy specific things that she did for England it's all kind of of course focused on William the Conqueror but I bet if we ever did go back in time and meet Matilda I think she would have been uh, very uh, close to um, modern day kind of mindset. She was very fierce, she knew what she wanted, she knew how to get revenge, and she was very educated and did what was best for her kingdom and peace. So, thank you so much for watching. I really hope you found this to be relaxing as well as informative. Again, I'll try to make this available to download should you want to use it for your own personal use. But thank you so much for listening and I hope you have a wonderful day. Take care.